Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Bridget Farah from the Metallurgy and Materials Society of CIM. Today's webinar topic is Risk-Adjusted Life Cycle Costs of Mine Water Treatment. It's presented by David Cretockville of BQE Water, President and CEO. Before we begin, I'll just go through a few housekeeping notes to ensure that you get the best experience. So for your audio, if you joined us with your computer audio, make sure that the computer radio button is selected. And likewise, if you joined us with your telephone, traditional phone, make sure that the phone button is selected. At any time, if you have any questions, whether it's about a technical or about the presentation, you can type them in in that question box that you see. We'll be collecting the questions and we'll be doing a live Q&A after the session. As well, we'll be conducting a poll during this presentation, so we encourage your participation. A reminder as well that this webinar is recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel afterwards. So today I'm joined with Nolene Ahern of Barrick Gold Corporation. She's the organizer and chair of the environment section of METSOC. And of course, I have our esteemed presenter, David Kretokville of BQE Water. So without further ado, David, I'm going to transfer presentation rights to you. And you can go ahead. Here we go. Okay. Thank you, Bridget. And uh, click on your PowerPoint. Yep. Thank you, Bridget, for the introduction. And hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us for the webinar today. We'll be talking a lot about water risks and costs. And I'll just start by stating that many of us in the industry see that thinking about water is changing and quite dramatically. Um, water has literally become a strategic issue for the mining business because it touches many different aspects of the business. Obviously the production needs, um, but also is subject to ever uh, more strict governmental regulations. And of course, also the social and, and sustainability side of the business that's also increasing in importance. So in effect, water is either a threat or an opportunity in many mining projects. And while water treatment costs are typically well-defined, the value of water treatment is poorly understood. And I think it's poorly understood because it largely lies outside of what we typically think of battery limits of, of water treatment. Now, you know, the stakes are high and decisions about water management and treatment are growing increasingly complex. And in the context of that, today's webinar is really to show you that decisions made about water treatment and management that are based on life cycle costs are no longer adequate and in many cases can lead to very erroneous decisions. So oh, life cycle costs, probably many of you have heard of the concept that really tries to capture all the costs of ownership of a water treatment facility, let's say, um, and it combines the capital cost in year zero with a series of annual operating costs discounted to the present using a discount factor um, that's basically very similar to net present value. In this case, it's a net present cost where the discount factor accounts for the value of money. Now, if you think about water holistically, you should include in the capital costs of the, of the uh, water in your project, not just the pipes and pumps and the equipment and installation of water treatment plant, but also the cost of permitting related to water treatment. And quite often water touches on tailings as well. So it's really uh, the whole cost of permitting around water. Also, uh, costs associated with securing and buying from local communities. Um, Water-related studies. I can tell you that a number of projects I've been involved in, um, the cost of water treatment or water studies in general far exceed the cost of water treatment plans. Uh, water management infrastructure, 
financial security and bonding, all of those are, should be included in the capital cost of the project, but not always are. And in the operating cost side, quite often long-term residue management is left out or ongoing environmental monitoring left out and closure and post-closure costs are left out partly because of the discounting effect where if they happen long in the future, 50 years down the road, really their, their impact on the overall life cycle cost is, is minimal. So what's the conundrum of the life cycle cost? Well, the problem is that life cycle costs are deterministic and as such, they try to capture everything, but in reality, they don't. What they don't capture is risks and uncertainties as well as potential value generation in projects. So the question is, really, if you think that your cost in year two is going to be $2 million, is it going to be $2 million? Is it going to be $5 million? Is it going to be $50 million? And none of that is really captured in the life cycle cost concept alone. Now, of course, these risks are both on the capital and operating side of things, and some of these examples are listed here below. Certainly, risk of delays with projects can be very significant cost to a mining company. Not always show up in life cycle cost comparisons for different options. Uh, getting the design basis wrong, obviously, or uh, effect of climate change. On the operating cost side, you may have inaccurate predictions of water quality, or as every mine site goes through change in mine plans, those changes are not necessarily factored into possibilities in the future during the life cycle costs when they may actually impact the cost of water later on in the project. So what are the main objections to life cycle cost-based decisions? I guess the first one is really the zeroing with time where you know this discounting that happens because the value of money sends a wrong message because risks that are down the road are not necessarily being discounted the same way as the financial risk or financial purely uh, uh, metric and therefore send the wrong signal and underestimating of risks later on in the project having major impacts on the cost overall. A life cycle cost, as I said, is a deterministic tool. So there's no way to account for the stochastic variables and the randomness of uncertainties and risks. And as an accounting tool, it doesn't really foster value creation. As we talked about thinking holistically outside the battery limits of water treatment. And finally, um, in the worst case, I'm gonna show an example of that. Um, people try to tweak the discount rates to somehow account for risks in life cycle costs by applying discounts and, and, and varying the discount rate. And again, that really just masks the reality and may lead to a wrong decision at the end. Let's talk about the value that I mentioned outside the battery limits. And so there are different buckets, value protection, capture, and generation. And you know, on the value protection side, obviously, uh, modern regulations are uh, maintaining compliance with them is, is extremely important to the mining company and any loss of production uh, that may result from wrong planning around water may be very costly. Um, you know, we don't want to get into situations of lack of water or blockades of local communities or mine sites just because there's uh, non-compliance issues. Value capture, obviously, if you can permit your project fast, get a buy-in from local communities, you can save capital costs, you're off to a good start. And on the value generation side, there's a number of different things that can happen there. But um, the two things I want to highlight uh, today is, is improved financing terms. You know, uh, the financial community is paying attention to mining companies and how they are dealing with sustainability environmental issues and um, and overall in, in their projects and rewarding them for sort of progressive thinking um, and transparency around these issues with uh, favorable financing terms that may be really a very important component of the uh, making the project uh, performance successful. And uh, the, the value of any kind of um, innovation that's being introduced into projects and related to water specifically um, you know, there are risks associated with that, but there's also value perhaps outside of this one particular project. In, in the case of companies that have multiple sites, uh, introduction of innovation in one project may actually change the business entirely 
uh, in the portfolio of projects and, and really compound. And that's not necessarily always taken into account, again, in the traditional battery limit of one water treatment project. Just to show you the, the, uh, the, the example of, of how wrong these decisions based on life cycle costs can be, I draw on Mount Polly, um, where in 2014, Hailings Dam breached and over 10 million cubic meters of water that were stored behind the dam spilled along the tailings. Now the site had a long history of raising the dam and the independent review panel that looked at the cause of the breach definitely identified that a geotechnical instability was involved. But the same panel also concluded that despite the geotechnical instability, the dam would not have failed if it had not been used for storing water behind the dam to the extent that it was. So let's play this thought experiment here and roll the clock back to year 2010. See, so we're sitting here, we've already raised the dam by about 15 meters. And we're kind of wondering, okay, is this the right way of going about this water issue? We're just building the dam, accumulating more water behind it. And so let's look at a couple of options. So the first option is, okay, let's keep raising the dam. But let's also apply for a permit amendment that would allow us to discharge water that may be off spec, but ultimately downstream in the receiving environment would be subject to dilution. And yes, of course, there are some costs of raising the dam, but after year 2014, so by the way, this is a nine year window between 2010 and 2018, so that's today. Um, you know, 2014, we've got that amendment, and after that, really, we're just maintaining the water inventory behind the dam, and the cost, therefore, to us ongoing cost would be zero. In the second case, we bite the bullet. We have to build a plant. It's going to cost us $10 million to build, and then $2 million a year to operate. So discounted to 2010, we're looking at about $23 million. Now, looking at these two costs, obviously, one would always select option A. And we all know that in reality, what happened after 2014 was a series of costs that we're not including in this analysis, such as the cleanup from the spill, such as the loss of production, such as repairs to the tailings dam, to the tune of roughly $110 million discounted, so this would be 2010 Canadian dollars. Now, what's important to highlight again is this is just the water itself nothing else, but that's not true. If you think about it more holistically, there are other costs to the company, including the, uh, the, the shareholder value, over $200 million of shareholder value, or increased cost of financing as a result of this failure, loss of socializing, et cetera. Now moving on to really um, differentiation between risks and hazards, because people actually use risks and hazards interchangeably and they are not really interchangeable. Um, what's the difference? Uh, let's take the example of sun and sunburn and as you obviously realize it's all about the exposure and so what's important is to realize is that risk is really uh, a product of a hazard subject to probability and consequence. That's really the big difference. It, you're not going to get sunburned just because you're walking outside and it's sunny. Good examples again, risk and hazard, um, interestingly, alcohol and plutonium are on the same list of carcinogens, but clearly they are very different in terms of um, uh, the, the, the potential risk of, of inflicting cancer on anyone. And closer to home, for selenium, for example, high concentration of selenium in a stream is a hazard, but to the extent that selenium can bioaccumulate, you have to understand the kind of environment it's in, low to Atlantic, what kind of species live in, you know, aquatic life. All of those things are actually very important in understanding the risk of bioaccumulation in the environment. So here on this slide, I listed examples of risks um, that are typically faced by water treatment projects during the project design planning phase and during the operational operability phase. Um, I'm not going to go through them all, but I will go through a few. I will specifically talk about the risk of changes in regulations, risk of unintended consequences of treatment, 
risk of lack of residue stability and change in water balance. Let's start with um, regulations. And in this case, we're talking about um, a gold heap leach project in net positive water balance environment, now subject to sulfate regulation below 1500 ppm. During the mine life, you know, uh, gold heap leaching, cyanide was being added, sodium metabisulfide, that's SMB, was being added. So it's basically accumulation of sodium sulfate inside the heap during the, the life of the project. So now in closure, despite the fact that all the cyanide has been destroyed, despite the fact that the rock in the heap is non-acid generated, will never generate acid rock drainage, the mining company cannot close the site and walk away. It has to keep running water treatment on site in perpetuity to maintain, to keep the salt, the sodium sulfate that's inside the heap, inside the heap, or ultimately suck those salts out and crystallize them at a, at a, a very, very significant cost. So it's an example where this was not necessarily considered at all. It's at the closure phase, but a significant cost is now hitting the overall project economics. Another example related to uh, residue stability is again from gold processing, this time milling operation and uh, dry stack tailings, where you know uh, dry stack tailings allow uh, water conservation, maximizing water recovery. And in this case, again, we're faced with a buildup of sodium sulfate. And the buildup of sodium sulfate is a lot more significant uh, in terms of concentrations compared to the heap leach example. Why? Because the inventory of water in the metallurgical process is infinitely smaller compared to the heat leach project. So where do these salts go? Well, ultimately, they all go with the tailings. And in this case, cover the tailings as crystals and dust, uh, sort of white dust that is carried away by wind and it um, spreads over uh, neighboring farming community which creates a lot of problems with the local communities and government. And not to mention that you know, any seep, any runoff, actually can infiltrate into the ground, causing further contamination of groundwater. Finally, example of um, water balance gone wrong. Uh, a mine went through permitting. Consultants uh, thought that this would be net negative water balance kind of operation. Mine actually invested into water wells for makeup water for the process. Uh, there was a permit for discharge, but nobody really paid attention to the limits that were being committed to, um, and they were extremely low. Lo well, and behold, uh, the site turned out to be net water positive in terms of water balance and um, faced significant costs of water treatment down the road, completely unprepared for this. So these three examples uh, show the three hazards um, that I just mentioned, how they translate into actual risks and the real impacts on the life cycle costs. And the fact that they were not really envisaged, they were not part of the life cycle cost, the deterministic part of the life cycle cost, and because they were not considered. But talking a little bit about unintended consequences, um, that's a topic that's not really talked about a lot in the water management treatment uh, community. But it's a real, real hazard. Um, I want to talk specifically about two uh, kinds of um, operations here. One is biological water treatment systems, and the other one is milling flotation, milling cyanidation. So in the case of the biological water treatment, it doesn't matter if it's passive or active. The two hazards that are out there, one is related to transformation of some of the metals or metalloids that are in the feed water into um, organoforms such as methylated mercury, methylated arsenic, organoselenium. And clearly the, the risk there is bioaccumulation in the receiving environment and inability to comply with regulations. As some of these um, methylated organo species are a lot more difficult to remove than the original inorganic species. And then the second hazard is related to the fact that you have to feed bacteria, you have to give them nutrients, sometimes organics, and they may show up in your treated water and be discharged into the environment that's not really um, able to cope with this. And or in the worst case of a, a treatment plant upset, you may cause fish gills or 
complete eutrophication of the streams or algae blooms. In the milling flotation, milling cyanidation projects, we've come across a number of instances where the formation of thiosols and thiocyanate was completely overlooked, resulting in problems with effluent, toxicity, and stability of tailings. Again, all of these are examples of mines that have these problems across Canada. And you always ask what happened, why that happened? And the answer is, well, maybe there wasn't really a proper risk assessment done around these things, or um, slipped through the cracks, or there was no reliance on what was perceived as the best available technology at the time, or simply the selection was based purely on life cycle cost. And uh, sometimes these biological treatment systems, especially the passive ones, pass as low cost options. So moving on to what we see as common deficiencies of risk assessments, uh, starting with lack of transparency and silo mentality. So on the transparency side, um, you have to define your success um, very clearly uh, to do proper risk assessments. It's not always done. Um, there is sometimes tendency to apply random factors or discount factors for certain, to certain risks. It's not very clear why. Um, the silo mentality, you know, a lot of these risk assessments are done in uh, narrow groups. So, you know, the health and safety people do their assessments, um, the environmental people do their assessments, the project people and operations. The metallurgist doesn't necessarily talk to the uh, environmental scientists. So this leads to, um, again, this kind of silo mentality around risk assessment. Bias, I think to some extent all of us are biased, um, biased in a way that you know, some hazards are more familiar to us than others. We may have a conflict of interest. Um, and finally, lack of expertise. A lot of these water issues these days require specialized expertise that may not be present around the table when the risk assessments are being made. And that really leads me to our poll question, Bridget. Absolutely. So everyone, if you would vote in your personal experience, what is the most common problem with risk assessments? Is it lack of transparency, silo mentality, bias, lack of expertise, or other? So put in your votes. So we'll give it a few seconds for people to vote. Mm. And we will share the results. Okay, quite a few of you voted. Let's see a few more. And give it one final second. I think we have all our votes. So here are the results. As you can see, we have um, 30% silo mentality, 41 bias, 22% lack of expertise, and 7% others. So bias was the clear favorite or answer. Back to you, David. Thank you, Bridget. And thank you for participating in the poll. Um, I guess from my perspective, I, I was really surprised by the, um, you know, I've participated in a number of these risk assessments around water, and the definition of success caught me by surprise. In one of the projects, I actually recall we we're sitting around the table for about an hour uh, debating the definition of success. So it's not very clear, and, and you know, um, intuitively, when you look at the image in the bottom of the screen, everyone thinks that we understand. We, we intuitively think we know what success looks like. But when it comes to actually formulating it in a way that's explicit and specific uh, for risk assessments, it's not always done and it's not always easy. Uh, but it's extremely important because unless you have definition of success, you don't know your failure. And what is really a risk? Risk is probability of failure times the consequence of that failure. So therefore you end up with fuzzy uh, risk assessments if you don't have good definition to start with. Also, what I find is quite fuzzy in many uh, cases is definition or distinguishing between business as usual and hazardous conditions. That may relate to administrative delays or financial difficulties, for example. Now, I wanna talk about risk importance of doing these risk assessments very early 
in, in, in projects, and I'm talking water projects specifically. It's obvious that you know when you're looking at a billion dollar investment in mining, um, these billion dollar investments are going through risk assessments very early on. But water quite often is a very small component of those projects, and the risk assessments are not always done quite early. Yet, significant commitments are being made and strategic directions are being set that influence cost, life cycle cost of, of water for the projects. Uh, the problem is that quite often in these early stages, there is relatively little information available. And But I also find that this, this lack of information is used as a way of rationalizing, delaying the risk assessments to the you know point later in the project where it may be actually too late. So how do we turn life cycle costs into risk adjusted life cycle costs? Well, you know, mathematically, uh, it's quite easy. It, you know, these deltas that I showed in the previous uh, slide, um, you, you, give, you basically show this delta now as a product of a probability times a loss or a value that's being generated every year of the life cycle um, uh, that's being considered. Now, the problem with this, mathematically it's easy, the problem is that how do you actually, how can you arrive at one central value for each one of these years when in fact, you know, the, the types of uncertainties and risks are constantly changing and it's not every year they're the same. Some of these risks are interrelated or compounding. Some of them are independent. You know, it's very difficult to actually capture it like that in one mathematical formula in a way. There's also difficulty, how do you translate loss of social license or loss of life into a dollar value in the life cycle cost, for example? Now, there's different ways of dealing with this uh, problem, um, but what we found here at BQE Water is that the, that the system that's being developed by Riscope Associates called OR, Optimum Risk Estimate, um, is, is really, really, really good and flexible and transparent, and we like using it. Um, the, the reason why I like it is, is because it reminds me a lot of Hazox, you know? So, so it starts with basically the system or project that's being breaking down into nodes. And by a system, you can think of the whole water treatment plant or a subcomponent of it, or you can think of the whole mine site, um, or you can think of a portfolio of different projects. It doesn't matter. You break that system into nodes, and then you subject these nodes to hazards, a list of hazards that are being identified, to generate what's called the risk registers. Now these risk registers are scalable, so you have these registers and you can fill in and modify and, and grow this, and as more information is available between scoping, pre-feasibility, feasibility studies, they are transparent. You know, these registers are actually storing explicit values of probabilities and consequences. So everybody can see them. It's not hidden, uh, very transparent, and they're drillable. Um, so you can actually query these risk registers and generate really good representation, graphical outputs from these uh, from this model. I'm gonna show several examples of the OR output. In this project, the client was looking at what's the benefit of building a polishing pond downstream of a water treatment plant. I'm not gonna show the whole mechanics of the model, just showing the output, you know, and there's three scenarios that we consider. Um, one was there's no polishing pond. So the water treatment plant was discharging straight into the receiving environment but the operators received additional instructions to minimize the risk of offset water. And the second scenario was there was a polishing pond downstream of the plant, and the third scenario was that it was a plant, polishing pond, and the operators received the additional instructions. And the output of the model was really the estimated frequency of major upsets uh, that would happen in any given calendar year. And as you can see, the effect of the polishing pond was that it reduced that frequency of upsets uh, tenfold. And with the additional instructions, there was a further reduction of 50% um, along with that. So this was a very, very important and, and actually very instructive for the client to value the pond that, would, that cost them money and was difficult to install in the case of, of um, you know, constrained footprint in the project. So it wasn't very simple but it really demonstrated the value to them of, of doing that. Uh, another example was a project where we looked at 
comparing lime treatment versus sulfide treatment to a particular stream. And the success criteria was defined as meeting regulatory limits, being able to adapt it to changes in feed water quality, uh, and a minimization of waste residue that was generated by treatment. Uh, we looked at three time horizons, short, medium, and long term. And uh, we basically broken down the water treatment plant into nine nodes and subjected them to 26 hazards. Um, the probabilities were actually based on operating history of um, the water treatment. And this um, graph shows the graphical output here. What I'm showing is, is, is these bars. The bars, the vertical um, axis shows a risk. And the bars are basically stacks of risks associated with each of the nine nodes in the, in the water treatment facility. So uh, the nine nodes, each one is a different color, and we're just stacking them up to a total risk for, for that water treatment facility in the short, medium, and long term. Now, if you want to basically say, what is this green bar, for example, you blow it up and you say, okay, well, that's the node associated with plant controls and monitoring. And you clearly see what are the components of the, uh, the risks associated with that node. And what's nice about it is it also shows over, you know, trending over a period of time. So it, it has the power of comparing different treatment options over a period of time. Another way of outputting the, uh, the model uh, is, is we're looking at this um, in terms of costs in the 3D. So um, on the vertical axis here is, is actual dollar value. And you see the hazards on one um, axis, and the other one is um, really the node system elements or the nodes. So again, graphical representation where the risks are and what's the dollar value associated with them. Another way of using the, um, the, the same methodology is to look at how do you want to go about implementing water projects. There's a lot of talk now about design, finance, build and operate um, options. Um, many years ago, it was a novelty. Now it's quite, you know, uh, many companies are intrigued by that concept. Uh, or should we go about it through the conventional procurement process um, through EPCM? And the model can be really used for this as well. And, and the answer is it boils down to uh, risk transfers and management within, within uh, the, the project uh, itself. And the execution phase target costs then becomes a sum of the deterministic, deterministic cost estimate prepared by engineering companies, plus the adjustments of that deterministic cost for uncertainties and adjustment for risk. Again, Two different things, uncertainties and risks are two different things. Now, in this case, the model is, is the output is very simple. Um, it basically establishes thresholds of price premiums um, over the capital cost and an annual operating cost. That if, if, if the, let's say the service provider offers the mining company to complete the project at certain costs, and these are higher than these premiums, these thresholds, then it's better to just follow the conventional route. We use the same kind of um, model uh, to tell us whether it's worthwhile for us as a service provider to take over uh, operation of, of water treatment plants for, for mining companies, because there's also risk involved for the service provider. So we use it in reverse, the same, same concept. And um, you know, as you can probably appreciate, every project is different. So these cost premiums are project specific, uh, site specific, client specific, because you have to consider that the, the risks um, are, are not always the same with every project. Now, I wanna talk a little bit more about uh, risks versus costs, risk transfer, absorption of risks and management of risk. And um, starting with basically the concept of how do you relate risks and costs. Well, if you're trying to minimize risks, generally you're increasing costs. The same thing in the you know financial world where you you know you have a portfolio. If you want to have a risk-free investment, you buy GICs, it costs you a lot. So the yield, which is uh, in inverse of, of cost, is 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 low. Uh, but the cost is high. The same thing applies here. So at the end of the day, what really the 
whole exercise is about is arriving at acceptable risk for acceptable cost. Um, when it talks to um, risk management, so the you know the the risk management 101 rule is allocate risks to parties that are best equipped to manage them. And in the context of water projects in the industry, you have multiple parties involved in these projects. And each one can actually take on and mitigate or maybe better equipped than others to mitigate certain risks. Um, I think it's also very important to differentiate between the capacity of any one of these parties to absorb risk versus the capacity to manage and mitigate risk. Two very different things. So when it comes to these um, uh, contracts uh, and risks, you know, you should be asking yourself a question about, you know, does your water treatment project require specialized knowledge? And if so, then in what areas? Because that already points you to the parties that may be involved, best involved in mitigating these risks. Now, when it, you know, talking about transfer of risks, you should think about these penalty clauses and warranties that are very often um, included in contracts as means of transferring risks. Um, but I think quite often they may create, provide uh, people with a false sense of security. Oh, I'm transferring risk, I'm putting these penalty clauses in there, but do you really? Um, and, and finally, think about incentives. You know, people don't always look, um, they, they look at penalty clauses, but not necessarily on the incentive side. Am I incentivizing anyone to mitigate risk for me? And, you know, an example of that would be, let's say, uh, if you have a, a project, it's a $10 million plant, um, and you have a company that's a billion dollar company building it, um, sure, they can absorb risk, but are they really the party that will be, that's incentivized to mitigate your other risks? They may absorb some cost risk, but what about the other risks in the project? Maybe they can deal with them. Um, the same thing on the operating cost side of the plant. So I'd like to finish the presentation today with an example of where life cycle cost analyses were used and actually arrived at wrong conclusions. Um, and this example really wraps a lot of the things we talked about today into this, um, what, what has gone wrong. And an example of uh, Partnership BC. Uh, Partnership BC is a, a company that was set up by the BC provincial government to look at developing particular infrastructure projects through public-private partnerships, which are really contracts between the provincial government and private companies that are sort of similar to the design, finance, build and operate contracts. The decisions whether to go private or whether to go with the traditional government procurement method of implementation of these projects was based on life cycle costs. Now, within these life cycle costs, they were adjusted for risks, but the risk adjustments were done through the discounting factor. Again, one thing that I highlighted right from the start may lead to wrong conclusions. Uh, in fact, the discount factors were manipulated in a way to show that there would be savings if contracts were going through the PPP type route. There were cherry picking of assumptions um, around the, uh, the assumptions around comparing two different life cycle costs and a lack of transparency. You know, none of the data was available uh, around these life cycle costs for about a decade. Now the forensic accountants got hold of this, issued a report. I encourage you to read it. Um, it's a fantastic example of life cycle costs going wrong. And at the end of the day, the BC public overpaid about $3.7 billion on 17 projects today, and there's still more of them in the pipeline. One of these projects, incidentally, is the Britannia Mine Water Treatment Plant. Uh, Britannia Mine operated for about 60 years in BC, just north of Vancouver, and it used to discharge acid mine drainage into Hub Sound. Um, high density sludge lime treatment plant was installed there, and it was one of those projects that was going through this uh, partnership BC program. And it, it was the decision was made that it should go through the, the PPP route. So in the case of the Britannia Mine Water Treatment Plan, um, the risks were again wrapped into this 20-year discounted uh, life cycle cost, and it showed that you know the 
going private route, it should save the uh, taxpayer about 30%. Uh, in reality, um, today, uh, the Britannia Mine Water Treatment Project is actually the only one of the 17 that on the undiscounted basis today still is better off doing the PPP than uh, going traditional procurement method. But the problem is that it doesn't end after 20 years. It keeps on going. So the life cycle cost continues beyond this initial period that the partnership BC looked at. And according to the Auditor General, there is now $3 million a year that you know our uh, government and us as taxpayers will be funding the ongoing operation of the plant that was not built into this original uh, estimate. So the, the actual savings are, are just going to diminish even further. Uh, more, you know, interestingly for me, looking at this, uh, there's a whole paragraph about how the cost of delivering, implementing water treatment through the, or any projects through these um, design, finance, build, and operate contracts, they actually require a lot of um, effort on the contracting side, the legal side. And so to go through this um, effort, uh, you know, and, and make it worthwhile, you know, the project capital cost has to be at least 100 million. If it's below 100 million, it's just not worth the additional effort up front. The costs are too high. Despite the fact that the Britannia water treatment plan was significantly less than 100 million, it actually still qualified through the program. And the other interesting part for me was these penalty clauses um, for underperformance. And what the forensic accountants found was that none of, you know, going through the, the private uh, route, um, part of that appeal was to minimize risk to the government, to the taxpayer. So it's a transfer of risk. But in reality, what they found was that the penalty clauses for underperformance were exactly the same in these private contracts as they were through the traditional procurement route where the government went about their business the conventional way. So in conclusion, um, there's no doubt in my mind that decisions based purely on life cycle costs are flawed, and they're flawed because they're missing uncertainties, risks, and potential value that's being generated. Um, I think that um, the value of water treatment is never captured in, in these life cycle costs because it largely lies outside the traditional battery limit. I think that the importance of risk-based approach and adaptive management is becoming more and more relevant in the industry overall. And you know there are many pitfalls uh, in risk assessments, but there is also ways of dealing with them. And um, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Uh, we have some time for a few questions for David. Uh, so just as a reminder, if you have a question, please enter it into the question box in the GoToWebinar. All right, we have a question, a few questions are coming in already. Um, David, to what extent can DFBOO incentivize the contractor to improve system performance over time? In other words, looking beyond penalty clause approaches, can we expect that there will be innovation benefits? Um, okay, um, can you repeat the question again? I, I think I caught everything, but there was a uh, part where okay. I you were cutting out. Well, beyond penalty clause approaches, can we expect that there will be innovation benefits? Um, well, I think innovation benefits from um, you know implementing new technology or um, innovate innovative uh, approach in how you go about contracting I'm not exactly clear about that but okay. yes definitely I think that going beyond the traditional penalty clauses is really really important um, and 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 again I'm, I'm talking about the incentives because you know incentivizing people uh, correctly, is, is a preventive route. Uh, penalty clauses and warranties are really kind of going going the opposite way. They're not preventing anything. Um, so they are reactive. And, and so um, I think the incentives are really important. And, and you know, in that context, innovation always has to be brought in to generate value. It has to be attached to value. If, if 
you know, you're trying something new, uh, there has to be a value attached to that because there's also risks of doing something that nobody has done before. So the value has to justify the, the, uh, the innovation itself. I don't know if I answered the question, but I tried. We, we do have an opportunity for um, people with, with questions to email David directly after the webinar to discuss anything further. Um, another question we have here, uh, do you see a role for regulatory intervention in dictating discount rates that don't devalue the long term? In other words, how do we prevent tweaking discount rates? Again, you were cutting out a little bit, Noli. Oh dear, okay. Um, do you see a role for regulatory intervention in dictating discount rates that don't devalue the long term? Or in other words, how do we prevent tweaking discount rates? Well, yeah, <laughs> um, I think, you know, the, um, what I think, the, the, you know, this example of partnership BC was really a good one where, you know, in reality, uh, the forensic accountants actually realized that you know, the discount rates for governments are extremely low, right? Because they, they have different means of borrowing money uh, than, than mining companies, private companies. So I think, you know, the general tendency would probably be for the regulators to discount uh, at very, very, very low discount rate, which highlights the importance of, let's say, closure and post-closure costs. I think that, you know, the, um, the, the uh, sort of the, Manipulation of these discount rates is um, is something that is is um, uh, perhaps I don't necessarily associate it with the with the regulatory agencies uh, that regulate mining, uh, but but perhaps with you know how internally you know mining companies are internalizing some of these life cycle cost decisions and using different discount rates. Um, I would I would really answer that way. I think that the regulators really have a tendency to use extremely low discount rates to start with. Uh, what do you consider to be the main barrier for the industry using risk-adjusted life cycle costs for decision making? Well, I think, you know, it, it truly is the, um, uh, um, I mean, the, actually the, the audience answered the bias was, was involved there. Um, and my, my answer would have been uh, the silo mentality. You know, I think that the way that the industry is actually set up, you know, how do how are we really set up? We have these environmental departments, projects, operations, and you know, the the, the linkages, the traditional way of procuring or implementing projects. I think that's what the problem is. That's the barrier. You know, if if I as a service provider talk to a procurement person, um, but the procurement person um, job is to look at costs and costs for that one project, not look at the value that may be generated or impacts this project may have on other things going on. And I think that just just the way that uh, the industry is set up um, for implementing projects and procuring projects, I think that's, the, that's one of the barriers that I see um, for sort of holistic uh, risk-adjusted life cycle costs to be used. We have uh, one, one final question that we have time for. Uh, BQE is known to develop and implement its own proprietary technologies. How do you prevent bias in selecting treatment approaches? Yeah, no, that's a very, very important question. Um, I think, you know, the, the reality is that um, we are, if, if you think about these risk adjusted life cycle costs, Whenever we go through an exercise with a client, we're not the only party at the table. And, you know, quite often there is a number of different companies involved. And um, I think that's another sort of very, very important part here to, to consider. And that is that you goes to the, the, the specialized expertise. So I think that while it is clear that we're more familiar with some treatment systems than others. If the, the, the treatment system that we're familiar with is really one of the front runners, it's important for us to be at the table and provide our input into these risk-adjusted life cycle costs because we probably understand the risks associated with the innovation that we're bringing to the table better than anyone else. 
I think that conversely, there is a notion of you know um, this risk-adjusted life cycle cost being unbiased if an independent consultant conducts it. The problem there, obviously, is the lack of expertise and knowledge of intimate knowledge of the treatment systems, and an inherent bias that that is brought in a different way. So I think the way we are preventing it is really by getting other people uh, involved, and um, you know, and, and the mining companies really um, have independent reviews conducted. And when we are sitting around the table talking about risks, it's not just us and the mining company. There are a number of different parties as well. And one of them would be Risco. Um, and I encourage you to actually reach out. We'd be happy to provide contacts to the guys from Risco Associates for you guys. I'm actually going to sneak in one more question that came in, um, just for a, a quick one. In a country where water is cheaply and readily available, what opportunities would you say exist for the government to incentivize mines to look at water efficiency? Yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, I think you know the uh, probably the uh, the answer lies in the, the the social aspect and the perception around the industry, and and so you know I think um, again. Uh, some of these really go to policy decisions and, and, and way beyond my, my pay grade. But the, it, fundamentally, I think the regulators care about minimizing risk to the environment and minimizing risk to the public. Um, so if there is no risk either to the environment or to the public from discharging excess water, um, then you know, there's no, conversely, there, there shouldn't be really any drive, strong drive and incentive forcing mining companies to adopt, adopt um, sort of water uh, conservation measures that, that, that are serving no one. They're not serving the environment. They're not serving uh, the public. Um, that would be my take. Um, if, if anyone has any further questions, uh, please do email David. Um, his email address is shown on your screen. Um, at this point, uh, that's all we, we have time for uh, to end off our webinar. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining, joining us. Thank you, David, for giving the presentation. We will be sending out a survey to all the attendees um, and would really appreciate your feedback on the webinar. We have another webinar in the series coming up on the 31st of October, and that will feature Marguerite Kalin, who will be speaking on mining, ecological engineering, and metals extraction for the 21st century. So please keep a lookout on the MedSoc website or via social media or uh, an email blog. Thank you once again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice afternoon. Hello.